Okay, I think we will start if that's all right. Let me just share my screen. Uh, that's the one. Perfect. So hopefully everyone should be able to see that. Let me get the chat out um, so that I can just monitor um, any questions that you might have. Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jamie, um, F2, currently working at Guy's Hospital. Um, I spoke to some of you, I'm sure, um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, we went through the basics of the A to E approach and how important it is. Um, and we talked about uh, shortness of breath as uh, a symptom and um, put it into context with some cases. So today I will be talking about chest pain. So um, probably won't be as long as the last session because uh, I still plan on going through the A to E beforehand, but it won't be in as much detail. Um, and then we'll crack on with, uh, we'll get, um, come up with some differentials for chest pain. And then uh, I've got three cases that we can discuss just to, to get us thinking about what, what we should think about on the wards. Um, so as before, A to E is obviously very important. It's a systematic approach um, and it's commonly used for unwell patients, but actually is used for um, uh, lots of different patients and from medical students all the way up to consultants. So it's, it's really useful. Um, and it's great to just have a, um, a method to go to uh, when someone's unwell and you might be a bit panicky or a little bit stressed. It helps to calm you down, just work going through the motions. Uh, and as always, it's um, perfect. Thank you. And um, yeah, just a message from a team there, guys, um, about some new um, short based answers uh, and some new textbook topics as well. So uh, principles, be systematic, A to E, be thorough. Um, and if you're worried, escalate and communicate with your team, be that fellow doctors or be that the nursing staff on the ward. Um, communication is really, really important. OK, just to make sure everyone knows what exactly what is going on. So. A airway, um, we, I didn't include any pictures last week, so um, here we go. I'll go through those in a minute. Um, so you're looking and you're listening to see, um, is the airway patent? Are there any obstructive noises such as strider? Are they snoring? Um, and you, uh, and then you're thinking about um, whether they're like, their characteristics are they are they a particularly large person who is at risk of having um, airway compromise, uh, and also thinking about is there any airway noise at all because silence is is the most concerning uh, feature, um, and then if there is a problem, um, normally there won't be, but if there is a problem, you need to think how urgent is this. But as a general rule of thumb, if there is a problem with the airway, you need to get an anaesthetist or an um, an ICU consultant or registrar there as soon as possible. Okay. A um, couple of simple maneuvers. Um, first, which we spoke last time, the first being the head tilt chin lift, uh, and the second being a jaw thrust. If someone can tolerate a jaw thrust, uh, then they are very unwell. Um, and then adjuncts, as we've seen here in the pictures. So one is um, just a Goodell, otherwise known as an oropharyngeal. Um, and you, you pop it in, uh, choose your correct side. Uh, by measuring from the corner of the lip um, to the angle of the mandible. Um, and they're very easy to put in and they can just help maintain an, an, an airway uh, while you're waiting for help. Um, on the right there, you've got nasopharyngeals, which you can put in uh, through the nose uh, and they can increase in size. They're also very, very useful, um, particularly anyone that's had oral um, sort of got, they might have oral problems like a, a malignancy um, or trauma to the jaw. Um, but just beware, they are uh, contraindicated in um, basal skull fractures. And then the last one is, um, they're called eye gels. Uh, they're also called LMAs. Um, and they are more secure than the other two. Um, and also very easy to put in, um, just put um, plenty of lubricant at the end. And um, you can uh, maintain a very good airway with that. Uh, anaesthetists quite often use them in theatre, actually. 
uh, and then thinking, does this patient need a proper endotracheal tube? Breathing. Um, so you're, again, assessing the patient from the end of the bed. How do they look? What's their work of breathing? Um, do they look blue? Are they using their accessory muscles? Are they tripoding? And then their obs, thinking about have their sats dropped and their respirate gone up? How much oxygen are they on? Have a listen to their chest and um, particularly in a trauma scenario, feel uh, their tracheal position more um, because you could be worried about a pneumothorax. Um, and then percussion can help you to differentiate between an effusion and the pneumothorax. So that's always useful. Um, if you're worried about if, if they've got an oxygen requirement or worsening oxygen requirement, uh, they tend to need ABGs, um, but using a clinical judgment um, as to when to run the ABG. Um, and it's always good to get a chest x-ray uh, as to look for the cause of pathology. Treatment and breathing. So with each step, remember there is treatment um, that you can use. So um, in breathing, we're thinking about oxygen, very simple, but um, very, very effective. Uh, depending on how bad their SATs are, do they need a non-rebreathe mask? Um, or can you just get away with some nasal specs? Or are they really, really unwell and they're retaining CO2 and they might need some non-invasive ventilation? Um, and uh, that you need to speak to um, the ITU guys about. Um, Circulation, um, have a look at them. Do they look dry or do they look overloaded? Um, so uh, with dry people, they're typically, um, they won't have any edema, their mucous membranes will be quite dry, their cat refill time will be prolonged, they'll have tachycardia and maybe hypotension, as opposed to overload patients who often have some fluid on the legs um, and can go all the way up to the thighs and the sacrum. Um, and always have a look at their JVP as well um, uh, for their cause of congestion, um, which could likely be cardiac. Um, and then examining them, have a feel of their pulse. Is it regular? Um, how, is it a good body? Um, is there a peripheral pulse or is there any essential pulse? Um, have a listen to their heart. Uh, and as I said, fluid status. Get an ECG on them to see how they're doing, um, particularly if they're tachycardic. Um, and then think about what treatments you need. And with circulation, it tends to be fluids um, or blood if they're losing blood. And for that, obviously, you're going to need uh, a cannula or two. Wide bore is always the best option. And um, it might be that they need diuresis, and that's why um, you've been called to see them, and that's why they've become unwell, uh, in which case you can think about giving them something like furuzamide. Um, most likely it will be intravenous. And if they're really overloaded, it might need to be an inf a continuous infusion. Okay. Uh, and then disability, these are the four that I always work through. Um, so their level of alertness, um, which if you're really rushed for time, just do a simple um, AVPU, um, which is alert voice, um, responsive to voice, pain, or unresponsive. Or you can do a GCS, which we spoke about a couple of weeks ago. Get their BM. Um, it's often a cause of pathology that is uh, often forgotten. Uh, and really, really helpful. Have a look at their pupils if you're worried about um, any intracranial um, things and uh, get a temperature as well to see if they're febrile. And then finally, get good exposure of the patient. Um, so that includes a number of things um, and it quite often depends on the ward you're on, but just always have them in the back of your mind. So a surgical ward in particular, you might be thinking about um, an abdominal exam examination um, plus or minus a PR, um, thinking about any lines that they've got in, be that central lines or peripheral lines, um, having a look at their legs, any cellulitis anywhere, any skin rashes or wounds that might be a cause of sepsis. And then once you've done the A to E, um, reassess, always reassess. Okay, have they deteriorated in the time that you've been seeing them? Um, if there's any change while you're seeing them, go straight back to A. OK, because um, A is the most important and that is the thing that will kill a patient quickest. All right. And then once you've got a bit more time um, and you've stabilized them, thinking about um, having getting a bit more understanding about the patient, particularly if you don't know them. So have a look at their, their notes that definitely have a look at their drug chart, any previous imaging um, or lab results and get a history. And this is particularly important in um, in chest pain, which is what we'll be talking about today. Um, 
but as this is an A to E session, it's very important to go through the A to E and then work out how stable the patient is. And from there, you can decide whether you can take a thorough history or whether actually they need action quicker. Um, again, always think about their escalation status. Is this a young fit person who would be for foot for everything? Um, or is this someone um, who is very um, comorbid and frail and actually they shouldn't be escalated to ITU if it were to come to that. Um, this has become much more um, important, not important, it's always been important, but people think about it a lot more um, following on from COVID, um, which is definitely a good thing. Um, and it's something that people should always talk about. Um, and then appropriate handover and thinking about what further investigations you want. So any imaging or any bloods that you think need to be sent um, and you can follow those up later. So um, chest pain, causes of chest pain. Uh, I've done a bit of rambling now. I'll get you guys to fire out some differentials. Can you fire out the common differentials of chest pain first? And then we can think about some more rare ones. Okay. So go for it. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. STEMI comes under ACS, as does MI. Very good. Pneumonia, fantastic. Dissection, great. Gourd, yes. Pneumothorax, fantastic. Any others? MSK, fan, yeah, really good, particularly in a and &E, But the important thing with MSK is to rule out um, worrying, concerning features. Pericarditis, yes, great. Yeah, anxiety attacks. All right, we'll leave it there. So essentially, it's a very broad differentials list, okay? And um, for that reason, examiners love asking about it, um, particularly in history stations in OSCEs, um, because you can get a lot from the history, all right? Um, so we will talk a little bit about that. Now, um, I've broken it down into, for my differentials, what I find for chest pain, is break it down into body system because as we've seen there there's so many different differentials so i tend to think about cardiovascular respiratory gastrointestinal and msk okay so cardiovascular you're obviously thinking about um acs um, pericarditis myocarditis aortic dissection um acs including unstable angina as well um you're thinking about respiratory causes. So as you guys well said, uh, PE, pneumonia, um, pneumothorax, um, all of that, um, pleural effusions, they can all cause chest pain. Um, gastrointestinal symptoms. So gourd, as someone mentioned, um, hiatus hernia as well, peptic ulcers, particularly perforated peptic ulcers. And one to be, you know, just to always think about is pancreatitis. Um, particularly on a surgical ward, uh, can present with typically it's epigastric that radiates to the back, but you know can be quite central chest pain. Um, so that's always worth knowing. And then MSK, uh, muscular skeletal pain, which is a tends to be a diagnosis of exclusion because you need to rule out the more sinister causes, um, and they'll typically have a history of um, either trauma or a twisting injury. Um, and uh, quite often are tender um, over the sternum, okay, which is a useful sign to elicit. Um, so chest pain, uh, I'm sure you've all done it at university at, um, in your first few years. Uh, Socrates, still go back to it, still really useful. Um, if you're ever unsure in a history, just go back to Socrates. Um, it's typically good for pain, but you can adapt it for any symptom. So for chest pain, thinking about the site, is it a central chest pain or is it um, epigastric? Is it sort of around the neck where, where, or is it either side? Is it a pleuritic type chest pain? The onset, was it a very sudden onset? Um, thinking more about uh, an infarct or a, um, a bleed like a dissection, um, or has it been getting worse and worse over the last few days, um, which is more likely to be a uh, respiratory um, pathology, or has it been going on for years? Um, uh, thinking more about uh, gastro, um, gourd, reflux type symptoms. The characteristic, is it like an elephant sitting on your chest? Is it more a burning pain? Um, is, it, is it a dull ache? Uh, 
So all those are very important. Radiation is um, key to know about in chest pain because uh, with ACS, acute coronary syndrome, um, the pain typically radiates from the center of the chest up to the jaw and um, to the left um, shoulder. Okay, that's the classic uh, history. Radiation through to the back, um, we're thinking more about uh, dissection um, and sort of epigastric radiation um, is likely to be some sort of gastrointestinal pathology. Um, associated symptoms. So are they really clammy? Are they really sweaty and hot? Um, thinking about um, uh, ACS. Uh, are they vomiting? Do they get reflux type symptoms? Um, thinking more um, gourd, uh, reflux. Um, any cough, any fevers, any sweats? Um, is the pain worse on um, deep inspiration? So these are all useful things to know. Um, timing we briefly discussed in onset. So how long has it been going on for? Um, and then exacerbating relieving factors. Um, so the classic exacerbating factors like pancreatitis would be relieved on leaning forward. Um, does is it help with pain, particularly ACS? Is it helped with nitrates? And then um, the severity. And this is one I always think is a little bit. Um, it is. I think it provides the least um, use. Um, because if you ask a patient how severe their pain is nine times out of 10, they'll say it's 10 out of 10, the worst pain I've ever felt. Okay. Um, having said that, if it is that you need to take it seriously, if they say it's one or two, then it's a bit more reassuring that there's not something very, very concerning going on. Okay. So, um, on to our first case. Um, so a 30 year old man presents to ED with chest pain. Um, the chest pain is central in nature and it radiates to the back, okay? So we're thinking about our A to E approach here. Um, and while we're doing that, we're gonna run through some differentials in the back of our head. So the airway is patent, trachea is fine. His sats are a little bit low um, on air, which is unusual for a 30 year old man. Um, but otherwise than that, it's, he's got bilateral air entry um, and his respirator is just a bit up. Um, I mean, but he is in pain. Circulation, he is tachycardic and his blood pressure is a little bit low um, with a prolonged cap refill time. So he's, he's underfilled um, is what we can conclude from that. And um, that's slightly concerning. Um, nothing came up from his um, disability and on exposure, he has a nice soft abdomen. He's got no um, wounds or anything um, but you notice that he's quite a tall um, bloke um, with quite long limbs um, so what are we what are we thinking yeah so it's a pretty pretty easy one but you're quite right uh, Abdul it's very important to be systematic and make sure that he um, doesn't have uh, anything else going on so aortic dissection is the most likely in this man. Um, and there's a few features that are important to know. It's a sudden onset of chest pain. It radiates to his back, typically between the scapulas, so in the midline. Um, he has long limbs. What do we think might be the underlying diagnosis there? Yeah, Marfan's fantastic, um, uh, who are um, predisposed to developing both aortic dissection and triple A's. So that's, and also berryaneurysms um, as a cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, so, you know, typical features of aortic dissection, it is not always this obvious, um, but it's important to um, work out what is going on with him. So what do we want for this man? What does he need? In the A to E approach, what do we want to, to help him? Fluids, fantastic, okay. Yeah, resuscitate him. So he needs a little bit of oxygen. We'll put some oxygen on him. Um, he needs he needs wide bore cannulas, okay? In a man with central chest pain with a, who is hypotensive um, and tachycardic, get two grays, one in each ACF, okay? Um, 
he's going to need fluids. I would give him a 500 mil bolus stat, see how his blood pressure responds. And then he's going to need more beyond that. Um, what else? So when we put a cannula in, what do we do? Yeah, so take some bloods and particularly important, get a clotting and group and save this man. Um, because if it does turn out to be an aortic dissection, he might well need surgery. Um, but other bloods also helpful because um, to, to rule out other causes. Um, uh, what else do we want to do for this man? Um, so let me go on to the next slide. So stable or unstable? Unstable, I agree, yeah. In a young man who is um, compromised, definitely unstable. Uh, there's a few questions here, sorry. Let me uh, have a little looky. Uh, yeah, analgesia, very good. Give us some more and more, definitely. Um, take a troponin and a D-dimer. Um, troponin, yes, I think that's a very sensible idea, but it could well be raised in aortic dissection as well. Um, but useful because if you then think about ACS, um, seeing whether he's got a troponin rise, it's very useful. Um, D-dimer, again, trying to rule out a PE. Uh, they're very useful tests and they're very um, sensitive, but they're not very specific. So other pathologies can increase D-dimer. Um, but yeah, definitely wouldn't say no to that. Uh, it's all helpful. Is he in shock? Yes, he is. Um, he is definitely in shock, uh, most likely a hypovolemic shock. And then... Um, so further history for him, just get a real good sense of his um, the, the nature of the chest pain. Confirm that it is sudden onset and it radiates um, and uh, whether he's had anything like this before. All useful questions. Investigation, what does this man need? A simple investigation and then a more complex one. Yeah, good. So all of those correct. ECG um, is the main one. Anyone with chest pain needs an ECG, okay? Um, and mainly to rule out um, cardiac pathology, such as an MI, okay? Um, VBG, very good as well. I like that. And actually, because his SATs are a bit low, I'd probably consider just doing an ABG on him um, and getting a, a, particularly getting a lactate to see how unwell he is. Um, uh, X-ray, yeah. Very good. Um, they probably would do that initially in A&E if, if you'd stabilised him. Um, uh, amylase lipase, yeah, you can definitely consider that. Um, probably a bit further down the line if we're thinking pancreatitis and we've ruled out um, more likely causes. But yeah, a CT. And it's, it's not just a CT, it's a CT aortogram, okay? So you're looking at the aortic phase of the CT um, when you give IV contrast. Um, and you will have, you'll be able to visualize the aorta beautifully and see uh, dissection. So like a tear in the intima um, and uh, um, see blood um, outside of the intima. Okay. And then um, treatments. Okay. And so let's say a CT does show that he's got a um, dissection. Does anyone know how we treat it and, um, or, do we treat it medically or surgically? Does it depend on? Two cannulas in, you've done a fluid bolus, you've given him, and he's got more fluids running, his, his blood pressure's responded. Um, yeah. Um, let me have a look. What's everyone else saying? Yeah, it depends on what type of the aorta. And it's very simple. There's, um, um, oh God, um, the DeBakey uh, classification, um, which is a bit complex, but essentially it's, is it type A or type B? Type A affects the ascending um, aorta, type B affects the descending, descending aorta, um, distal to the left subclavian vein. Um, Type B is managed medically with tends to be beta blockers. So you need to maintain that heart rate around sort of 70 and their blood pressure around 100 to 120 
Okay. Type A is managed with surgery and uh, through an aortic root surgery um, replacement. Aortic root replacement is the one that tends to be used. So just get on the phone to cardiothoracics and organize that. Um, can you please prioritize the investigation treatment? So top three in order. Or... Okay. Um, yeah, so priority of investigations for this man with such a typical um, history, um, the most important investigation for him is a CTA autogram, okay, because that will diagnose it. Um, yeah, type B does need surgery, can often need surgery if medical management fails. That's very true. Um, in terms of treatment, um, resuscitation is always number one, um, A to E, so fluid resuscitation. Um, and then, as I said, either surgery or um, beta blockers, depending on the, the type. Okay. But stabilizing the patient is the most important thing. Okay. So moving on to the second case, unless anyone's got any more questions, how are we doing for time? Okay. Not too bad. Um, so uh, you bleed by a nurse, um, patients develop chest pain. How do you approach it? So First thing to do is on the phone, uh, get some obs from her, her him or her, um, ask, are you worried about them? Do they seem unwell? Is this new chest pain? How severe is it? That sort of thing. You might get very useful responses, which is great. Um, you might not, and you might just have to go and see the patient quickly yourself, okay? Um, so the A to E, as we've said, um, yeah, very good. Uh, airway. Um, let's say it's patent, fine. Um, respiratory rate is normal. Um, he's breathing fine, not using accessory muscles. Sats are 95% on air. Um, and he's got bilateral air entry. Um, C, he, uh, his heart rate's 80 and he's hemodynamically stable. His cat refill time is about three. Um, so I'm not too worried about that either. Um, D is all fine. E, um, abdomen soft and tender. He looks a bit, um, looks a bit clammy, looks a bit sweaty, um, and looks uncomfortable from the end of the bed and maybe a little bit grey. Um, so that's our A to E. From the further history, so someone a clammy patient um, who has central chest pain, um, we need to think about ACS. That's the most important. So ACS is acute coronary syndrome. And that is that incorporates unstable angina. So that's chest pain at rest, okay, but without any ECG changes or chop changes. Um, N STEMI, which is a uh, non ST elevation myocardial infarction, and also a STEMI, which is ST elevation myocardial infarction, which is the most concerning of the three. Um, so you want a history, central chest pain, does it radiate to the jaw, does it radiate to the left shoulder, um, have they had this before, have they ever had any previous cardiac events before, do they feel nauseous, have they had any analgesia and has that worked, um, particularly nitrites, which they might even have on their PRNs, um, all of this is important. Um, what do you need there and then, what do you need from them or the nurse? Yeah, excellent ECG, okay. Um, get it as quickly as you can. And while the ECG has been done, you can do your A to E, or if you've got a bit of time, you can do your history. Um, if they're stable, uh, you can go and look at their previous ECGs. That's always a useful thing, okay. When someone has an ECG that you're not quite sure about, compare it to their previous one because they might well have had the um, problems um, or the changes that you can see in the past, all right. And with an ECG in terms of um, ACS, what changes are we thinking about? Any changes on the ECG? Yeah, Q waves, yes, niche. Um, often uh, Q waves suggest um, previous MI. Um, and yes, very good. ST elevation, T wave inversion, and ST depression, okay? So looking at all the leads um, and um, looking to see whether there are, and they typically, they correlate with each other. Um, so an anterior infarct would have um, uh, changes in sort of V1, 
um, V2, V3, V4. Um, and uh, yeah, reciprocal changes. So an inferior MI will get, you can get ST depression in the inferior leads. Um, fine. So yep. Yeah, and then as with all ECGs, looking at the rhythm and looking at the rate, is it regular? And are they tachycardic or are they bradycardic or are they doing okay? Okay. Um, heart block, yes, but doesn't typically present with chest pain. Um, uh, tall T waves, uh, often a sign of hyperkalemia. Um, again, might not present with chest pain. Um, more likely to be palpitations. Okay. Um, fine. So you get this man and this is his ECG. So I won't ask you, um, but I'll give you all 30 seconds to have a look through that. So we can see ST elevation in V1, V2, V3, V4. We can also see some ST depression in V2 and V3. Um, and lead two as well. Okay. Um, it is regular. It's the rate is fine. It's sort of 70, 80. Um, yeah. And the, the diagnosis here is an anterior STEMI. Okay. Um, and this is very, very worrying. Okay. And um, you need to A to E, get them resuscitated, make sure they're all right. If they're all right, thinking about what interventions are we going to do. Um, so let me, so treatments for this, treatments for a STEMI. Um, there's medical treatments and then there's interventions. So medical treatments, um, I just remember the um, mnemonic MONA. So morphine, it's really, really good for pain. Okay. Oxygen, get, get it. Yeah, very good. Get a 15 litre non-rebreathe on them. Uh, nitrites, so isosorbide mono, mononitrite is really good um, to give routinely, but GTN spray as well is fantastic for relieving pain. And then A is not it's not just aspirin, it's uh, antiplatelets. Um, so they may well need um, double dosing of uh, antiplatelet aspirin and clopidogrel, okay? Um, they most likely will do, actually. Um, so 300 milligrams of each. Just be very wary um, and make sure you have a look at the history to make sure there's no big risk factors for bleeding. So, for example, um, we have a guy upstairs who um, has really bad hematuria, um, but also had an end STEMI. And um, we made the decision not to give him clopidogrel um, because his bleeding would get worse. And it's, it's a very difficult decision that tends to be made by consultants. Um, a discussion between the surgical consultant and the cardiology consultant. Okay. Um, and then say this is a, well, let's say this is a 65 year old um, woman, independent at home, has a bit of diabetes, but that's it. Um, what, what other treatment can we do? Okay. So, after medical treatment, we can think about, yeah, primary PCI, okay, um, percutaneous coronary intervention. Um, so you get them to a cath lab, a hospital with a cath lab, or if you've got one, refer them straight there. Um, and um, they'll need stents most likely, okay. Um, and you're completely right. After that, they're going to need secondary for prevention. So they need a pretty high dose of atorvastatin. They'll need to continue on dual antiplatelet therapy for a year and then go down to single um, agent. Um, they will need um, good control of their diabetes. Um, so all of these things are very important and good control of their blood pressure. OK, um, typically with ACE inhibitors because they've got um, prognostic benefit in patients with um, uh, coronary uh, ischemia. Good. Um, so, sorry, I've realised we're, um, oh, she we're doing okay. I'll try and rattle through this. Um, so this patient, let's say you thought he was stable, everything's done, he's going for PCI, and then he turns to leave and the nurse says, he's, you're really worried. She's really worried about him. She doesn't think he's responding anymore, okay? Um, so A to E, 
airway is patent b he's not breathing and c um you cannot feel a central pulse okay so you've looked for signs of life for 10 seconds look listen feel um and this man has died so what do we do now yeah so cardiac arrest um yes very good always good to check the resuscitation status um the nurse should typically know and it'll be on their handover so it should be very quick okay if it looks like someone who should be for resuscitation um if it don't delay um because immediate cpr is incredibly beneficial okay it's a very difficult one to judge though and it tends to be just there in the moment um but you're right get the crash trolley there which will have the defib on it and you need someone and this is where it's very helpful to make communication your priority okay because you will likely go and go straight on their chest start doing cpr at um a rate of uh, or just continuous um, while you're getting the defib set up um 100 to 120 um compressions per minute and give someone a direct order to put out a double two double two um call because you're wasted doing that um and say you've got a cardiac arrest here um yada yada if someone's asked you to do it um then you always need to put the the whether it's an adult the level the location and what ward they're on okay um and people will come very quickly if it's cardiac arrest in the meantime um so looking at this this is the recent guidelines actually from the resuscitation council so as we said they're unresponsive doing cpr um 32 if you can um, bag valve them great um, uh, otherwise if it's going to delay things just carry on with cpr um, or if there is only you there then carry on with cpr wait for someone else to come who can help you to, to bag valve them um, and then get the defib on um, you will typically do it put it on aed setting if you're there and you're inexperienced with more people there you can put it on the manual uh, and see and you you're basically assessing their rhythm okay so the most important thing to work out is are they in vf or are they in vt all right and um if they're in either of those uh, i don't have an ecg for those i'm afraid but if they're in either of those then you can um you can shock them all right uh, and you give a shock um typical dose i think is about 150 joules um and um adrenaline as well okay if they're in a non-shockable rhythm, you don't shock them, it won't do anything. So that is PA, which often looks like a sort of sinus rhythm, but you cannot feel a central pulse. So that's pulseless electrical activity. Or if they're asystole, so they're flatlining, shocks are not useful. Um, so uh, the best thing to do there is adrenaline, okay? And you can give adrenaline every two cycles of CPR. Um, and... Uh, um, the other thing for shockable rhythms is you can give amiodarone after the third shock, okay? And you can give a good couple of doses of that, all right? Um, but people should come to you very quickly. Um, and then when you do your ALS, which you'll probably do an F1 or F2, it's, um, it's about working out why they've gone into cardiac arrest, okay? So it's managing an arrest and then working out why. And that's your four H's, four T's. Um, so having have a read about those um, You'll find them in any medical website. Um, but in this case, this gentleman um, likely had a massive infarct, as we know, because we saw his ECG. And so thrombosis was his cause. Um, and in that situation, you can give alteplays, um, which is basically a clot buster. Um, the only uh, caveat of that is you should continue CPR for 60 to 90 minutes to give the alteplays time to work. Um, and um, which can be absolutely exhausting. Um, so if that is the case, get a Lucas machine there um, as quick as you can to take over the CPR. Okay. So that's just a bit of, about um, ALS, um, which is always worth reading up about and refreshing. Um, so I will try and uh, wrap this one up in five minutes or so. Um, try and keep it short and sharp. 
So a general medical ward, you get a bleep, about a 67 year old man who has got chest pain. So airway and breathing are okay, although he's got a very high rate, and he looks to have a bit of an increased work of breathing, although he's maintaining his SATs now. Um, so his blood pressure is fine, but his heart rate is 148. Um, cat refills three, so he's probably a bit dry. Um, and I've put heart sounds one and two and zero, but it's very difficult to hear if they're running this high. Um, disability, no concern, and um, exposure, no concern either. So we've got a tachycardic patient who is at the moment stable um, and no signs of, uh, of shock. Um, but what do we need to do for this man? What does he need as before? Yeah, fantastic. So this man needs an ECG and an A to E assessment, exactly. And giving fluids, um, giving treatment along as you go. So airway was fine. Breathing 94, if his wrist rate's high, I'd probably give him a couple of litres um, just to help him out. Circulation with tachycardia like that, you want to get a couple of um, cannulas in um, and try and give him a fluid bonus to see if it'll bring it down um, because ECGs always take time, okay? Minimum, it's going to be five minutes to get an EC, a good ECG on a patient, all right? So you've got time to put a cannula in, send off some bloods, thinking about why he's tachycardic, okay? Um, so he does have chest pain, and that is very useful to know, okay? And you can ask him a bit more about the history once he's stabilised. Um, but don't forget tachycardia, thinking about all of our causes of tachycardia, this guy could be septic. Um, so it's always worth sending off some blood to getting a, a VBG as well, okay, while you're on circulation. And then um, getting an ECG. So, um, oh, I didn't mention for the other bloke, sorry, um, in his bloods at C, when you do a catheter, a, a cannula, sorry, um, send off a troponin and then another a repeat drop three hours later um, because it'll be elevated if he's had a myocardial event. Um, so this is this man's ECG. Uh, I'll give everyone a minute to have a look through it. Would you carry out septic screen? Um, yes, once you've sta stabilised him, I think I would. Um, if he hadn't had a fever, I probably would hold off on antibiotics for now until you've had a look at the ECG. Um, but I'd definitely give him fluids. Um, I'd definitely monitor his urine output and I'd get, get a lactate on him, give him some oxygen, um, and blood cultures, again, dependent on whether he's febrile. Uh, pericarditis. Uh, interesting. Is this for his diagnosis from this ECG? Um, central chest pain, tachycardia can definitely be associated with pericarditis. Um, however, what ECG changes do you get in pericarditis? Yeah, widespread ST elevation, exactly. And this guy doesn't have any real ST elevation, um, but it's typically in all leads and it tends to be saddle shaped, okay? Um, uh, T-wave inversion, uh, I guess you could convince yourself V1, yep. And um, lead two has some, um, two and lead three and AVF, yes. Um, very good point, okay, which would imply ischemia. Um, now, we can think about ACS, does this man have ACF? But other than his T-wave inversions, he doesn't really. What do we think about it? Is it regular? Is it, um, is it, what's the rate? So the rate here is about 150 and it is regular, okay? So think about, are um, the algorithm for chest pain with a sinus with a um, tachycardia that is regular with narrow QRS complexes? Okay, now everyone's making good suggestions such as PE um, and what was the other one? Uh, pericarditis, but 150 is a high, high tachycardia. Okay, it would be a it would be considerable. Um, to see that in a, if, in a different pathology, okay? It's most likely going to be SVT, exactly. 
Now, the differential between SVT and um, AF with fast ventricular response or atrial flutter is um, tends to be the regularity. Um, you can also think about looking at the P waves, but here you can see he doesn't have any P waves, and that is likely because they've been swallowed up by the QRS. Okay. Um, so just take it at face value that this man has a tachycardia 150 that is regular. And using that, um, we can keep all our differentials in the back of our mind. That's all very useful. But in the interim, this man needs um, the you need to go down the tachycardia algorithm, okay, because this is the most likely. Now, the first thing to mention here is if they have shock, so if his blood pressure was sort of less than 80, if they have syncope, so they've lost consciousness, if they have myocardial ischemia, which you could think about the T-wave inversion here, but I'm thinking more proper ST changes, or if they've got crippling heart failure and they've got fluid overload and they're like crippling pulmonary edema um, then you need to get a medical registrar there and an anaesthetist there um, ASAP because um, uh, you're going to need to do rapid sequence induction and shock them okay and it's actually very commonly done in recess um, you see it quite a lot um, but if any of those features are are there you need to think very carefully about who needs to be there okay um oh can i uh, how do i get a rate of 150 very good question i didn't i made it up from the um uh the history previously um but yeah as you've said 300 a very um, crude way of doing it's 300 over the number of large boxes between the qrs all right um so uh just going to this so this guy's narrow qrs looking at the bottom right um, it is uh, regular. So the first treatment for SVT is a vagal maneuver. Okay. And the most common one done is blowing into a syringe. All right. It increases the intrathoracic pressure, which is why um, it um, helps. Um, but if that doesn't work, you need to think about medical um, management, such as um, adenosine tends to be the one. Um, you need a minimum green cannula in the ACF to give adenosine. All right and you need to get them up on a cardiac monitor and you need to tell the patient that um, they will feel like they're about to, um, they'll feel like they're about to die and there's impending doom. And that's because um, the adenosine puts them into back into the rhythm via um, them going into asystole, okay? And it's quite concerning, but the reason you, you can be assured by it is because the half-life of adenosine is only a few seconds um and then if that's unsuccessful you can increase the dose um but get senior support there um if you're giving if you if you're needing to give a and you need someone more senior there all right um and then uh you can have a look at the the tachycardia algorithm for af it tends to be beta blockers or if they're hypotensive digoxin is very good because it won't drop their blood pressure whereas beta blockers will um and then um, broad complex tachycardias are more concerning. And amiodarone can be given, but tends to be you have to give it through a central line. Um, and if someone's in a broad complex um, tachycardia, shocking is quite often what, what, um, what happens. Okay. Um, oh, that's what I was going to say. Um, just a final point, um, which is really useful one to have in the back of mind and I only learned in my F1 is um, ischemic change is seen in ECG of a patient who is tachycardic um, often can be rate related okay so if you imagine your heart is working really really it's beating really really quickly um, you're not going to get enough blood supply to the um, to the myocardium and for that reason you'll get hypoxia in the tissues um, and subsequently they become ischemic um, and that is most likely what's happened here they've got a rate related ischemia um, rather than um, a primary cause for for that ischemia okay has anyone got any questions about those those cases how do you differentiate between sinus tachycardia and svt very, very good question. And it is really difficult. The rate tends to help. So if they're around 150, 
it's way more likely to be an SVT than the sinus tachycardia. If they're 110, 120, um, more likely to be sinus tachycardia, you'll be able to see the P waves better. Um, and they don't have such a narrow complex QRS in sinus tachy. Um, as you can see here, the QRS is only like one square. So um, one small square. How do we know there's ischemia? So signs of ischemia on an ECG are ST changes, so the elevation or depression or T wave inversion, okay? And I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but in V1, um, we've got some T wave inversion there. Um, and in lead three, some T wave inversion there as well. All right, and in AVF. Okay, but minimal. Uh, yeah, very useful to repeat the ECG. Yeah, in patients like this, I'd, I mean, they need to be on a cardiac monitor first and foremost. And um, yeah, do serial ECGs on them to just firstly to check that their SVT is resolving. Um, it should result, they should go straight back with adenosine or vasovagals. They should go straight back into a normal sinus rhythm of 70, um, but always good to do an ECG then. Okay, just so you've got it in your documentation as well. Uh, management of dissecting. Uh, so descending aorta was medical management with beta blockers to keep their heart, um, their heart rate around 80, 70, 80, and their blood pressure around 100 to 120 systolic. Um, ascending aortic dissections need, I mean, depending on their frailty and everything, um, but they tend to need aortic root replacements done by cardiothoracics. Okay. Perfect. I hope that was helpful, guys. I would really um, uh, put the feedback link in the chat. Yes, I can indeed. Uh, there's some references. Um, would let me get this. Uh, where is my PowerPoint gone? Sorry, bear with me, everybody. Um, let me just copy and paste this. Uh, So that is the Google Doc, and I'll just share my screen so everyone gets the um, QR code again. Okay, yeah, um, both Azim and I would really appreciate your feedback um, for me and um, also for Bite Medicine. Um, it's very, very useful and very much appreciated from you guys.